This is a sermon from St. Paul's Church, Brookfield, Connecticut, transforming lives through Jesus. For more information, go to www.stpaulsbrookfield.com. Let us pray. Oh God, honor, glory, might, and blessing is rightfully yours. I'm so thankful to be together this morning in worship to come before this almighty goodness you offer us in Jesus Christ our Lord, who will come again, who is coming into the world. May we be ready. And as we prepare to be ready, may we be who we are before you, loved by you, in need of you, changed by you, through your love, in Jesus' name. I love Advent. It's not a penitential season, it's actually a celebratory season. That's why we have hallelujahs in that first hymn. At the same time, it's a serious season. It's a season to take stock of our lives and really to see what it is we're focused on as followers of Jesus Christ. Now, I hope we all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I hope that we gave thanks to God for all that we have. We have so much. At the same time, I've always thought it was probably a very confusing holiday for the average unbeliever. I would think that the most awkward moment for an atheist is when he or she feels thankfulness well up inside and then has no one to thank. We were designed for worship. When we give thanks to God, that's how we cap off the experience or the expression of what really feels good to us. It completes the experience of blessing, and that's what we have at all times and at all places through the God who loves us with an everlasting love through Jesus. And we give thanks, not just on Thanksgiving Day, but at all times and at all places, including this morning as we begin a new church year through the season of Advent, with a special focus on the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. No, not as a tender babe in a manger, not this time, but as a mighty judge who will judge this world. We're going to hear this morning about the end. But let's remember that the end, according to Jesus, is actually just the beginning. In fact, somebody once said, everything will be all right in the end, and if it's not all right, then it's not the end. <laughs> that bears repeating. Everything will be all right in the end, and if it's not the end, or if it's not all right, then it's not the end. What does this mean? Well, we look at our world, and anyone can see that things are not all right. They're not. The promise of God is that in the end, for those who believe and trust in Christ, all will be right. All will be right. And that is how we will know that it is the end. And yet, it's actually the beginning. What am I talking about? Well, let's look at the Word of God. Revelation chapter 21. I would ask you to close your eyes as I read this. Words can hardly describe what awaits us. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. You can open your eyes. For the Christian, the end for us is not chaos, sorrow, and annihilation. It is order, unspeakable joy and restoration, the beginning of a new heaven and a new earth. 
Yet in our gospel reading, we hear all about destruction. That is not the last word for the believer. And you think about this. We do see glimpses of this world being described in Revelation. Two realms fully united around us today. Think about where you see this. In thankful children saying grace at our tables. A young person in church lighting a candle with another family member. Hopeless lives turned around by faith. Healing in all of its forms. The warm glow of God's love experienced in worship together, which is certainly what I'm feeling. I hope you are as well. We're capturing a foretaste of something amazing. The promised land. It's a spiritual promised land as much as it is a material one because heaven and earth will come together at the end of time, which will be just the beginning. And the reason it's possible to experience heaven on earth now, which we should expect to experience, even if it's incomplete, is because we were designed for life, as was our universe. Jesus references the moon and the sun and the stars. Let's focus a bit on some cosmology, things we know through science. Now, things may seem still underneath your feet, but right now the earth is revolving around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour. <laughs> We're so minuscule, we don't experience it. And nevertheless, that's how fast we're moving. That speed perfectly offsets the sun's gravitational pull and keeps Earth's orbit the proper distance from the sun. <clears throat> if Earth's speed were any less, we would be gradually pulled toward the sun, ultimately incinerated. On the other hand, if Earth's speed were greater, it would, in time, move farther away from the sun to become a frozen wasteland. And then you think about our moon. The moon is very important. It stabilizes Earth's orbit and rotation, limiting the variations in our climate and temperature, regulating tides and seasons. Without our moon, the axis of our planet would have wobbled dramatically, perhaps by as much as 90 degrees, causing complete havoc. How often do we take these things for granted? The fact that we live in this finely tuned universe, made for life. Is it random? No, it's not random. The former atheistic astronomy turned believer, Sir Fred Hoyle, said that the chances from his study of life on our planet emerging randomly without a creator would statistically be the same chances as a tornado sweeping through a junkyard and assembling a Boeing 747 from the materials. <laughs> or the entire solar system, full of blind men standing shoulder to shoulder solving Rubik's cubes simultaneously. <clears throat> Think about that. Think about this amazing world we live in, fine-tuned for life, just as you and I are fine-tuned for heaven. Heaven on Earth, now, as much as we await the new heaven and the new earth. This may seem confusing. Nevertheless, it's our reality according to the word of God. And as you experience heaven on earth, you capture that sense that there is certainly more than what we know. There's so much more. But the more we know, the more we know we don't know. But what we do know is that God is love. And in God, there is no darkness at all. And God calls us to be children of the light. Now, God has set in motion forces for our good all around us, underneath us, and within us. So if this is so, we could ask, why is our world suffering so profoundly? How do we reconcile that? Well, as we go to our gospel this morning, this is what Jesus is dealing with directly, head on. A few weeks ago, we looked at Mark's account of the end times. This morning, we're treated to Luke's account. Jesus is describing the end of our present world as a consequence of our brokenness through sin. Just as we experience forces for our good, we also have a way of yielding in our sin to forces of harm. We know this. You can think of the ways this occurs in your life, perhaps. Every day, just as we glimpse heaven, so we glimpse hell. 
hell, manifested in disease, violence, hatred, hardness of heart, and unbelief toward our Creator. As these forces increase, and they are, unleashed under God's sovereignty, so the end becomes more and more recognizable, doesn't it? Jesus says there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. Our benevolently created world, delicately balanced, will begin to tip as these forces intensify, inaugurating tribulation. We're not there yet. Yet Jesus said we can see signs. Is it the tsunami, the earthquake, the famines, the wars all around us? Yes. Will they intensify? Yes. Is that the end? Yes and no. Or it's just the beginning for the believer. Now there's an ancient heresy called Manichaeism, which emerged in ancient Iran in the third century, and it held basically that evil and good are on this cosmic struggle <coughs> Two equal forces at each other, leaving the person wondering, who believes in this, who will win? It was called a heresy by the early church, precisely because Holy Scripture makes it very clear that this battle is nowhere near equal. That God, the Creator's goodness, is far more powerful than the forces of evil in this world, for God is forever on the throne, promising to make all things new. Beginning with Calvary's cross, where sin was nailed to it, and forgiven for all those who repent. And through Jesus' resurrection, where death was vanquished, today God continues to take our most wretched actions, especially as we yield to these forces of harm. And God works them for good for those who love God and are called according to God's force of goodness. We're going to mess up again. We do. We're going to yield to forces of harm. But forever Jesus through his Holy Spirit, is pulling us into the force of God's goodness. We live in a very painful world. We lead painful lives at times. God's force of goodness, nevertheless, is above it all, beyond it all, and within it all. Because God is what we call sovereign. You hear about the mystery of evil. Let me challenge us right now to think about the mystery of goodness. Give thanks for the mystery of goodness. Now what does the Bible say about Christ coming into the world? There are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus Christ. Additionally, the Old Testament describes details not fulfilled in his first coming that will be fulfilled in his second coming. The precision with which the details of his first coming were fulfilled validates the Old Testament and establishes the credibility of those details prophesied with regard to his second coming. Sort of like the atheistic turned believer, Sir Fred Hoyle, describing the fact that our universe could not just be a random creation. When we look at the prophecies fulfilled in Jesus' life, where he was born, the circumstances surrounding it, it cannot be random. There is precision in the scriptures. Jesus fulfills it. And only a few people ever saw Jesus during his first coming as a baby, his mother, his father, a few shepherds, perhaps a few people connected to the town of Bethlehem. The second time he comes, however, everyone on the face of the earth will know it. This is the greatest, most widespread event in the history of the world, and God is right now setting the stage for Christ coming again. The final judgment and the final state of everything. But the end will be the beginning for those who put their trust in Christ. This generation will not pass away, says Jesus, until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. What does this mean? How do we interpret this verse? Well, it means that we have been in the end times since the cross. And in every age since, 
the living generation of believers, that's all of us right now, should be able to recognize the beginning of the end pointing to the true beginning. Look at our amazing universe. Consider the intricacy of how we've been created. And then look at how there are flaws in our created order because of sin. We see things intensifying. We must be able to read the signs of the times. Not out of fear, but out of joyful anticipation because of Christ who loves us and who comes for us today and cataclysmically at the end of time. You've heard a lot of information this morning. Advent does that to a preacher. One wants to tell the congregation everything about Christ that can come in. But it really comes down to this, how do we live this out as we go home today or wherever we go, as we go through these doors? How then shall we live? Live for Christ. More than anyone or anything else in this world, live for Christ. And His Holy Spirit, despite our tendency to yield toward harmful forces, His Holy Spirit will save us into the Father's goodness. Just up the road. One day in 1789, the Connecticut House of Representatives was in session. The sky over Hartford suddenly darkened, became black. Some of the representatives glancing out the windows and seeing the ominous sky feared the end was at hand. Quelling the clamor for immediate adjournment, Colonel Davenport, Speaker of the Connecticut House of Representatives, rose and said, the day of judgment is either approaching or it is not. If it is not, there is no cause for adjournment. If it is, I choose to be found doing my duty. Therefore, I wish that candles be brought. Thank you, Jack and Linda, for bringing us candles this morning to help lighten up our world right here. A symbol of the fact that we need the light of Christ to see through this dark world. And these candles remain lit also as a sign that we are ready. We're alert. We're anticipating something amazing which will be the end, and it will be the beginning. So be alert, do your duty, whatever that may be. Live for Christ. Let us pray. Light of the world, may your light of faith burn bright in us. For the darker the hour, the brighter you shine. This Advent, may we become candle lighters to those you put in our path as we share the hope of heaven on earth. It is to you and in your holy name, Lord Christ, that we pray. Amen.